Good evening, everyone. Welcome to After Orthodoxy, Cultural Creativity and the Break, and the break with Tradition, also known as the name of this event is too fucking long. Rusha Tivas would have been fine. I'm Luza Tversky, and unfortunately for you, I'll be your MC tonight. And it's so a first for me, so naturally I am very well prepared to get this completely wrong. Uh, this whole evening reminds me of a story I heard when I was a kid. My father told me the story. He said there was a machitten interviewing his... Everything good with the sound, yeah? I thought you were... Okay, everything good, okay. Um, this machitten... Uh, do I say machitten or machitten? Who says machitten? Who says machitten? Raise your hand. Machitten, raise your hand. Machitten, raise your hand. Oh, it's going to be that kind of night. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Yiddish is Yiddish. So this Mechitten asks the boy who's, who's been suggested for his, for his daughter, he looks him up and down and he, and, and he asks, Zugma, can Slenen? And he says, Mistam, eh, I don't know, I never tried. But probably, you know, I know how. So this is kind of like the same thing. I, so it asked me, like, could you MC this the event? I was like, I don't know, I never MC before. I'm assuming I can. It couldn't be that difficult. If a guy can do it, I can. <laughs> you know? So... This is, this, is not, this is very easy for me. I've been getting things wrong my entire life. I'm very well prepared to fuck this up as well. So we've got uh, a wonderful, wonderful panel uh, of performers and speakers here tonight. We got ex frumies yeshiva dropouts, poets, musicians, filmmakers, uh, and performers who all decided at some point that they're gonna get rid of their black hats and the wigs and the endless rules and they're going to chase freedom. And with that, instead of finding freedom, we found a whole bunch of new ways to overthink everything. I personally went from you can't make out with anyone to you can make out with anyone you want. You just have to go to therapy about it afterwards. We traded one set of restrictions for another. And each new rule book is more confusing than the last. And we are all, in one way or another, trying to tell us, trying to tell you how that transition feels. Earlier in the day, you heard from the professors and the academics, and they were giving you the cycle of things. Uh, we're about to give you the feels. And let's be honest. Um, tonight is also a little bit of an anthropological exhibit. And we are the specimens. The people you'll see up here tonight, we are the specimens, the lab rats. We're the ones who made it out, and now we're being analyzed, dissected, and cataloged by the academics in the other room. So if you're feeling a little twitch, don't worry. Someone is doing research on you. <laughs> but here's the thing. Tonight isn't about getting it right. It's about having the courage to show up, mess up, and keep going. You'll see poets, musicians, and filmmakers putting it all out there, knowing full well that it might not land, myself included. And that's okay. We're all out here taking risks, failing forward, and maybe, just maybe, stumbling upon something real. You may be down there watching me and thinking, oh, my Baldarschen. You know, you'll see a film and say, ah, I could not agree more. I'd much rather you be up here than me. I wish these nerves on you. So maybe next year, this is our first year that we're doing this, we couldn't get anyone, we couldn't get everyone uh, involved, and there's a lot of worthy people within our community who should as well be up here. Um, but this is our first, and hopefully there will be more. And next time, I'll be down there looking up at you and thinking to myself, you really shouldn't have done it. Because <laughs> that's the beauty of it, isn't it? In this golden alumnus, you can be as right or as wrong as you want. And nobody's got a monopoly on stupidity. This country is built on the idea that you have a right to be wrong. You have a right to screw it all up. And if that isn't something worth celebrating, I don't know what is. 
I personally plan to keep doing that for as long as I possibly can. So, let's raise a glass to being wrong. Well, there's no glasses. I guess when I wrote this, I thought there was going to be food. <laughs> to trying and to laughing at our own ridiculousness, because if we're not getting anything wrong, we're not really doing anything. Um, and a big thank you to, to the organizers, uh, Naomi Seidman and uh, Zalman uh, Newfield, <laughs> for putting this together. Uh, to the sponsors who I did not write down, and the and the Evo Institute for hosting us, and everyone who who help, who lent a helping who lent. See, my English is still not quite there. Uh, who lent a helping hand to make this event possible. And without further ado, please welcome Pro Gluck, the director of the film that we're about to see, Castles in the Sky, who will introduce her film. You don't have a shtech? Um, wow, that's an excellent introduction to, I was literally about to explain how this film got cobbled together, so thank you for setting the stage. It's an honor to be here, Nomi, Zalman, and everybody who helped make this happen. Uh, you know, it takes visionaries, and then the rest of us could sit around, like Loser say, says, and we'll be like, oh, we could have done it this way, maybe we should have done it that way. Trust me, I get it. Um, so I just want to say thank you. You took a big risk of combining an academic conference with a creative piece, and I just love seeing everybody I've been reconnecting with here and meeting new people, so thank you for that, truly. Um, the film you're about to see happens to be the last film that I finished, but it's also quite appropriate for everything Loser just said, because our main actress, uh, Lynn Cohen, uh, passed away very soon after we shot the film, so we couldn't do what's called pickups, which means that we had to cobble it together and make it something that could potentially work as a story. And we leaned very heavily into the poetry. You'll meet one of the poets tonight, Jeremy Arantaub. We leaned very heavily on Frank London's absolutely stunning composition. And we leaned very heavily on, uh, we created this kind of fake radio show that we thought might help pull things together. So I'd be very curious uh, to hear and to talk to you about it. This is a blend of uh, formerly Hasidish, Hasidish, non-Hasidic actors together in a story called Castles in the Sky. And we'll be back to discuss it after. Thank you, everybody. And this is the film, as I just said, called Castles in the Sky. everyone, good evening. I'm, I'm still processing just that stunning, stunning film. But thank you so much for being here for uh, the, the first and only panel um, as part of this art celebration of um, post-Orthodoxy. And I'm just delighted to be here with these talented people. I'm going to give a brief bio and maybe buy myself some time uh, before, before Sarah comes. So we just saw this beautiful film. Uh, that was directed by Pearl Gluck, whose work has been part of the Sundance Lab, the Cannes Film Festival, Rain Dance, Tribeca Film Festival, and PBS. Her first documentary feature, Divan, takes her back into the Hasidic world of her youth th through the pursuit of her great-grandfather's Rebisha couch in Hungary. Some of Pearl's narrative shorts, whereas Joel Baum, Summer, and Castles in the Sky focus on stories set in the Hasidic world as well, her films, Stars and Bars, a short narrative film set in central Pennsylvania, and Little Miss Chassid, a documentary feature in collaboration with Naomi Seidman about Polish Jewish educational activist and Beis Yaakov founder, Sarah Schneer, are in production. So welcome, Pearl, and thank you so much for, for joining us. We have Sarah Ehrenthal to my right here. A no Brooke <laughs> oh, sorry, Sarah, sorry, 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 my bad, yeah. my bad. Thank you so much for coming, That is Sarah. the most offensive thing you've said to <laughs> Melissa all night. Sarah is a Brooklyn-based, self-taught, multidisciplinary artist and activist whose work focuses on displacement, survival, liberation, and social justice. Born into an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family, she left home at 17 to avoid an arranged marriage and spent the next two decades creating art and traveling the world. She works across painting, sculpture, and performance, often integrating everyday materials into her process. When not in her studio, Arenthal can be found working on the streets, reinventing discarded objects and painting provocative portraits, some of which have been shown on the screen uh, in between our sessions. Arenthal's work 
has also been presented in solo and group exhibitions in New York City, Montreal, and Tel Aviv. Lozer Tworsky, over on my left, I'm not gonna confuse you, um, <laughs> is an accomplished actor and writer. We saw him in this, in this amazing film. He's originally from Borough Park, Brooklyn, and has appeared on stage in New York and Sweden and on screen um, in Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime Video, and cinemas worldwide. Um, and then Melissa, over to my right, is an actor, producer, writer, and consultant with a focus on giving marginalized individuals and communities a voice. Melissa has appeared in shows such as Unorthodox, Little America, High Maintenance, and an award-winning winning film such as Felix and Meira, uh, Meira, Romeo and Juliet in Yiddish, and Sadekis, among others. Melissa made their theater debut in 2017, playing Monka in the New York Times Critics, uh, Critics Pick God of Vengeance, a really, really fabulous, fabulous production. So um, I, I wanted to just take a minute to read the bios of these fantastic artists. Um, you know, the United States doesn't do that much to support art nationally, and we have this opportunity to be with these, um, to be with this amazing, amazing set of, of artists, and I really want to encourage everyone here um, to support their art and um, the art that comes out of uh, ex-Orthodoxy and OTD um, by bringing them to your institutions, by, by buying, buying their work, some of which you can, you can do at exhibitions, and by hosting them, putting up good reviews on social media, um, because this is the way that we enable more and more recognition as well. So. So I, um, I created a, a short list of questions that no one, <laughs> no one responded to, which is fine. <laughs> Um, because that's what it means just to be an artist. Just you wait. So we're gonna, no, we're, we're gonna, gonna we're gonna respond tonight. now. Yeah, we're respond. gonna respond. We're just a little <laughs> late. Better. We're just Even a little better. late. Even better. Um, so my, my the topic of my first of my first question is about the freedom of artistic expression and and your identities, um, which are 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 multiple and complex, but one of which is ex orthodoxy. And I wanted to ask you all in your individual ways. To to, to think aloud about how artistic expression and the desire to be an artist facilitated or influenced your decision to exit your, your native community, your community of origin, or perhaps to delay that exit from the community in which you grew up in, and in what ways that artic artistic expression keeps you connected to that community, in touch with that part of your history, um, and or pulls you apart from it. And I'm, I don't wanna make any assumptions about the complexity of that relationship. So I thought we'll start here and we'll make our way around. Um, sorry, my brain functions in a way where I can only do one thing at a time. So if you don't mind, <laughs> let's be real, right? Um, so first, your first question is, um, how does the, my art, like, can you? Yeah, first so question. the first question is, how did your desire to become an artist, to be an artist, connect with your identity in your community of origin? Cool. Um, so my art practice started as a um, self-healing tool, I would say. Um, and there were a lot of things that I hadn't worked out that I found myself talking about in my work um, that helped me um, get it out of me. Um, and while I also, I've I've over the years, my work has evolved to talk on things that are not just about me, about humanity as a whole, um, I find that it's all like interconnected to like, so like if, I've, if I'm making work about my ex-Orthodox experience, um, it, it could touch like, sorry, the question was if it relates to the yeah, community, how right? Connects. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> You're doing great. The question is, how are you doing? You're You're nervous. Nervous. How are you doing? Um, yes, I, I do a lot of work, and I have touched on a lot of work, and have made exhibitions, particularly touching on my ex Orthodox experience and what it meant to grow up in it, leave it, and then also discover myself and finding the person that I am today. Um, and what was the second part of the question? 
So the second part is just about how your art has kept you connected to that community or maybe has served to liberate you from it. Um, so as I said before, it's definitely served a huge, huge uh, purpose in helping me liberate. Um, I think the way... <laughs> I think the way it does keep me connected to the community is that, first of all, I have a bit of a following and I know that I have some people still in the community who follow me and they see the work I'm putting out there. I also do a lot of public art so people stumble upon my work. Um, and I've also uh, done special, mo I've had special occasions where I go back to some of the neighborhoods where I grew up in and create public art on the topic and have exposed it to them. Um, so uh, there are many ways in which I definitely um, touch on it. And I've had exhibitions where people stumbled in and people who would, you know, maybe some Orthodox people. And I've had, I've had like intentional visits by Orthodox people who were curious to hear what I have to say. Um, so, yeah, I feel that. I definitely feel like I'm connected, yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Mazel. Can you repeat all five questions, please? <laughs> uh, I think that the... Uh, see, when I first started acting, I, I, uh, I, 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 it became very clear to me very early on that this is a very tough business to get into. And there's a lot of people who try it for years and years and years and never get anywhere. Um, so I think that in a, in, a, in, a, in a completely practical and not a very uh, uh, not a very uh, um, uh, heartwarming way, uh, I did it because that was my way in. You know, that was my comparative advantage against all these other you know uh, amateur or aspiring actors. Um, I had a beard, I had payas, I spoke Yiddish, um, I knew a community that no one, I mean, very few people who go into that industry know. So I kind of use, kind of use that to kind of like push my way through the door. Um, but it's always been, to me, the, the reason I make a lot of films with Hasidic Jews, not all of it is by choice. <laughs> As an actor, you only get the parts that you're given, uh, except if you create something. Um, so through the storytelling, for me, it was always important, not as much the authenticity of the beard or the hat or, the, or, or any of that. For me, I was constantly trying, and to this day, this is, all, this is what I do if I get a Hasidic role. You know, I, I try to look at the role and try to think, who does this remind me of? Like, do I know a, per do I know a person like that? Because so much of the, uh, of, the, of the material that is made about Hasidic Jews, either films or books or any kind of stuff, it's made by people who are very good at filmmaking or very good at writing, but not very good at chassidying. Is that a word? <laughs> professors, yes. any no. professors yes. here with word? Pro You're a word I'm, professor. I'm a word professor. There you go. I confirm, that's a word, um, I think that's what we call it in Borough Park, by the way. We call, it, we call you guys word professors, because <laughs> we don't know anything about college. Um, so, uh, you know, so to me, it's always about, it's about the inner character, it's about the person. It's about his emotions. I, I'm, I'll, I'll never forget that uh, uh, a few months, I did a film uh, uh, in 2019 in the West Bank uh, and it, it just recently, it's just now started to come out. And my little brother, who is completely Hasidic, married with kids, never seen a movie in his life. Um, he came to see uh, this film. He only stayed for 20 minutes, you know, because after 20 minutes he's like, yeah, I get it, you're in the desert. No, I get it, I understand. You know, I don't need to see the whole thing. <laughs> Um, but what was interesting about it, because he's never seen me act and he's never seen a movie. Oh, thank you so much. And what about her? She doesn't want water? <laughs> no, you already got okay. mine. <laughs> See yeah. Um, and I remember after the film, he came up to me and he was like, eh, it's funny, you're doing Shlomo Zalman. <laughs> you know, basically telling me, he's like, oh, you're doing an impression of this guy we know. So to me, that's important. It's, for me, it's authenticity, it's emotional authenticity. You know, so it's not caricatured. 
You know, like I know someone like that. That's what it, that's what he's really like, and that's 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 what, that's how I differentiate all these Hasidic characters that I play. Is that they're completely different people, and I try to individualize them. That that's my that's the part I play, Thank or you. try to, mostly unsuccessfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be, <laughs> no. 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 Superstar. I'm just no, not going to be as do funny yes as and. yes and. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, for me, it started as well with as more necessity. It's like I wanted to act, and I studied acting, and then these were the roles that they were looking for. And then I realized how much there was a need to for the authenticity, because people were good at filmmaking and not good at whatever word you made up, and um, they didn't they it's didn't have word. understanding. It's a real word. It's from her class. I learned it in her class. Um, so now my, my goal is, it actually very much connects me to the community because what I'm focusing on is there's so much negative portrayal. And, and, and many of, a lot of it is valid, right? But there's also so much beauty and things that like, if it was so easy for me, and it was just this black and white, good or bad, my life would be so much simpler. But I love it so much. I love my family, and, and there's so much beauty in the community as well. And so my focus now is I have to focus on that because I want to bring that too. I want to bring authentic joy and humanity, which is ugly sometimes, but, it's, but, but there's also so much beauty. So for me, I, I do, I'm actually spending a lot of time now in the community as I'm working on a project um, to really also, well, because I want to be close to family, but also because, um, I want to be embedded in that, so I see all of it, and I can bring a real, true portrayal of it. Right. It's also like there's been so much neg so there's been so much negative coverage yeah. of the Hasidic community over the last uh, you know uh, 10, 20 years that I, I personally almost feel like we gotta we gotta pull it back. It's like we've been we've been showing all the things that we don't like about the community, but we never really got to, got got to tell them what we do like about the community. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of things to like, you know. Um, and, and just in general, it, 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 it's a beautiful place to be in. You know, it's, it's like if you, if you can live in it, it's really, really beautiful. If, like, if you can tolerate it, if you can live with those rules, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's also like, I'm, it's almost like a, I think at this stage of my career, like I'm almost like I'm doing a pulling back kind of thing. It's like, no, 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 guys, listen, it's not just child molesters, I promise you. You know, um, there's, there, there's really nice things. Yeah. So yeah. So I, and it also like shaped me. And I'd like to think I'm a good person. I try, you know, you know to, to do the right thing. And a lot of who I am is from my family and from the community I'm from. So it's, yeah, it's not all bad. And, and exactly, like there's a lot of pulling back. And, and, and now it's harder because now there's so much, um, there's a perception and sometimes a misrepresentation that people already assume that's the norm. So when they meet me, and luckily I have a good relationship with my family, they're like, oh, that never happens. It's like I have to then say, no, well, it does. It's complicated. And it's not all beautiful, but it, but it, it is beautiful. It's, it's messy, though. And, you know, it's something that you have to actively now fight against because there's been so much uh, portrayal of negativity, which, again, there's, a, there's room for but now, yeah, I'm in that position too of being like, okay, let's pull that away and let me show you. And also I think there's so much beauty in the nuance. To me, that's, that's where it all is. It's the nuance of it. It's like, I struggled in that and I loved it. And that's where the pain and the beauty comes from rather than the anger and just one thing, you know? And I'll add one more thing and then I, I, I really wanna hear what Pearl has to say about this. <laughs> Again, you know, been listening to her for 15 years. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Perfect. You wanted to add one more thing. Yeah, I don't know what it was. <laughs> no, the second you start speaking, I'll be like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Go ahead, Pearl, say something. Thank you. No, I, I agree all around from the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Um, but it's I actually do remember what I was going to say. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> New guy shine. I want to add one more thing, is that also, since we left, the community has changed. That's another big thing, is that now I go back, like 10 years, 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I first left, I remember calling my sister. I was homeless on the street, hungry. I remember calling my sister, asking her for food, and she said, 
it was, it was Saturday night and said, yes, but you can't come into the house with jeans, so I'm going to put the food outside and you can take it from the outside. Right? And now I go back to like Muncie and Barapak, you know, I don't go to shul, but if I pop in, there's a bunch of kids with jeans. I'm hanging out with, you know, at people's houses on Shabbos and people show up. Nobody asks if they drove and walked, you know, it's like, it's a different, there's, there's, there exists this whole kind of like new Hasidic movement that is kind of like, don't ask, don't tell. But they're still very much part of the community. Yeah. Perhaps it's because... And, and that made it easy, yeah. Like, do you think it's because of the... Sorry, It's no? because of us. Yes. Right? I was going to say, yeah. The yeah. betrayals. It's because yeah. they're... So, so maybe that was time. Maybe it was necessary for then. To yeah. They change, and now we got to be like, okay, let's find some balance. We have finally affected change. Pearl. I think it's okay Pearl. to criticize while also... Because there's clearly, like, so much wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, there's room for criticism everywhere. So, but yeah. definitely, yeah, the more we criticize, the more they're going to think about themselves. I feel bad for you. Pearl, your turn. <laughs> the floor is yours. Jessica, I mean, say something. My work is done, as far as I'm concerned. Weren't they incredible in the film? Thank you. Uh, you're looking at reasons why I do the work, right? I mean, Sarah's relatively new to me. I've known Loser for umpteen years. Um, I met Melissa how many years ago? Malky Goldman, who's in this. Aaron Taub, who you'll be hearing from later. The poetry. He's going to read the whole poem that's used in the film. I mean, when you meet incredible artists like this, you know, our job as directors and writers is pretty much done. And I'll be the first to say some of the best lines in any of the films that I've written from Where's Joel Baum? That was our first film together to the one we just shot in central Pennsylvania, which has nothing to do with Hasidism directly, but everything to do with how I was raised and I think also what you're all saying here. Um, some of the best lines come from them. I think what's important, uh, you asked about what art, art does when you quote unquote exit or come from your roots and move somewhere else like we all do whichever our backgrounds are, some stay in, some quote unquote stay in, some quote unquote stay out, but across many cultures, I think this is true. It's either platform building, which from what I understand what was going on this morning was very much that. I've heard incredible things about your dialogues this morning. So I just, I know Loser poked a little bit of fun at us being poked at, but we're also grateful for that. And it's also, you know, so you create this platform and this possibility for these kinds of things to happen, where they bring their, um, it's like when I tell my students with directing, I mean, all we, honestly, it's the easiest job on earth if you allow it, which is you just decide. So you just have to create a place for people to be their authentic selves, and then they bring it forward. But in terms of my own escape, uh, you know, a, a escape, transition, and so on, um, it did happen through poetry. So uh, I'm a terrible poet, so therefore I became a filmmaker. I'm sorry, I apologize in advance that you had to sit through my phone. Um, but I, I actually would sneak out and go watch poetry or um, my first, uh, or films even. And I remember going to a poetry slam and that was it for me. And so for a very long time with my work, because this isn't my first film, I didn't immediately want to write about that for other reasons. It wasn't quote unquote dramatic, you know, it didn't have that big push through. Um, and it was this latest project with Lynn Cohen that I said, okay, this is it. This is where we take poetry as an escape, literally what you're asking. A person who, you know, it works both ways, right? A person who is attracted to a certain form of communication, in this case, poetry. And that form of communication doesn't accept the world that she lives in. And her world doesn't accept this passion that she has. And how do you meet them both? And it was based on me, but it was also based on my great aunt Malka, who told me that uh, you know, before the war, when they were living in Hungary, she would go and you know, check out you know, non-Orthodox shuls to see the art in the architecture, I'm like, did you say churches or shuls? And she said, no, we went to like the neologue shuls, you know, where they had some beautiful things in there. And then later she would like read the New York Times, you know, sipping through her katskatsukur, the black coffee that she would drink. And, you know, she would say, don't do what I do. And of course I did exactly what she did, <laughs> what she did. And I left, but she stayed. 
And so I thought a lot about that as well. So this was my way of infusing the character with my own story. Um, and then I think you asked about the way that it speaks in both directions. And so, you know, the bridge goes both ways. I remember when Divan came out, I was very, very nervous about my father's reaction to it. Um, and I, you know, I went and showed, this is a documentary film, for those who don't know, that came out in 2003 about my own journey outside and back into the Hasidic community that I come from, Hasidic Chevelle, through the story of my great-grandfather's couch, or the pursuit of a couch. And um, this piece of furniture kicked off my um, continued obsession with um, cultural objects that tie me back to my youth, including my grandmother and great-grandmother's needlepoints, the chandeliers, you know, all that stuff. It's in my house in central Pennsylvania. Anyway, Divan came out. It was about me and my father. It's a documentary, but of course, it's a crafted narrative. And um, I was very nervous. So we sat together. I showed it to him. And he looked at me and he said, it's not a bad movie, but why do you have to be the one who does it? And it's exactly what I was worried about. Like, he'll go to shul, or shiel, in this case might be, and it would be tough for him. But he didn't raise that with me. He just asked me to remove a couple of the pictures because they felt private to him. So I took them out, and the film came out. And even though he didn't say, you go, girl, it felt as though he is the love you were talking about, right? It felt as though the support was there. I was one of not so rare, but lesser known situations where there was family support, but in a non-traditional way. Things have changed a lot since then. Since then, they do go to university. I have a niece that just got her master's. I'm not the first person anymore. I mean, I'm the first person, but I'm not the only person in my family anymore that graduated from college. So things are changing, you know? But I remember when it came out, I was so nervous. And I had gotten hired to do this gig uh, for something called Sound Walk. That was a walking tour of Hasidish Williamsburg. I think it's still out there somewhere. And I was very nervous to go back into Williamsburg, but a gig is a gig, and I had to pay my very exorbitant New York rent. And so I took it. And we head back into Williamsburg, and I hear, this is the floor was gemacht, Divan! And I was like, oh my God, they're going to throw something at me. And it was the opposite. They came up to me. They wanted to talk to me. So again, there are these ways in which conversations are had behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Things have shifted. Now it's a far more open dialogue, thank God. Um, and I think they understand that there are ways now to integrate the arts into the community. There are Hasidish women and men that are teaching, painting, maybe not as subversive as some people want to be, but at least it gives them an outlet. So there's, you know, it's beyond just being the head of dance in Beis Yaakov anymore. So hopefully that answered the question in a roundabout way. Thank you. Can I add a quick yeah, thing, just please. because I was so nervous, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. Um, because what you said um, makes me think of like what I was exposed to like art-wise growing up. Um, so my mom actually makes art, but she was always making like very traditional, or like most of the art that people have in their homes are like, I'm talking about ultra-Orthodox, I'm not talking about like anything more modern than that, like the way I grew up. Um, most people have, you know, paintings of rabbis or like some farm scene or some trees and pretty lake or so you don't you definitely don't see contemporary art and we certainly don't get exposed to the art world. So like we never went to museums or galleries or got to see what art really is. So it took me many years after I left orthodoxy to start seeing enough art to start understanding that art is not just copying a picture of a tree or a scene in Jerusalem or a rabbi and you know and a particular style which is you know very traditional style of painting so it took a long time for me to learn that I too can be an artist even though I don't like to draw like that um, so yeah that's the actually I'm gonna be annoying now yeah go for it I want to say it. something about your art um, that maybe you're nervous you're not saying it <laughs> or maybe I'm imposing it on your work Go for as it. I see it. Um, the thing that really speaks to me about Sarah's work is the sense of the leftoverness that we all feel about ourselves, like some of us feel broken in different ways. But there's an eisvarf, which is literally the word, if you leave the community, like you're really considered 
marginal, if not garbage, depending on how your family is, if it's deeply dysfunctional or there's some tendencies of so, such deep fear that it might come with a level of harassment and dismissal. Again, as I mentioned, I know about my privilege as, some, as, as someone, and I think you're mentioning yours, as someone that comes from a family that's a little more open, yours has become more open. But the bottom line is the sense of leftover, the sense of otherness, the sense of uh, left behind, garbage, broken, is very strong. And to see you bring the leftoverness on street corners and sidewalks and broken things and infuse so much life into it, to me feels so deeply connected to your actual journey as an artist. And I just love it. It really, really speaks very deeply to me. And you know, it's also the shrayam, right? The leftovers on the Rebbe's plate that everyone's like yearning to get. And you see shrayam, you see the sacred everywhere, even in the profane. And I just really just wanted to underline that about your work. Thank you. I have to um, respond that. So like you I don't said have earlier, to. no, I have to. Oh, no, you do. Okay. Uh, we have time now. I'm sorry. What was you your name again? <laughs> Jessica. Yeah. You're good. Respect, um, Sarah. You want to join, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun just listening. You Sarah, can come you to the to the discussion. Um, so I said earlier that art is like started as a self healing tool, and I think like when I started, I actually was so broke I couldn't buy art materials, and um, so I would go out of the street and try to find materials and bring it home to paint on. Eventually, I started leaving it where I found it, and that's how I ended up doing what I do on the street. Um, this is my work, by the way, in case um, anyone is curious. <laughs> it's not, unfortunately, not an overpurposed material. I was running late, and um, it's just a regular foam board. But um, I tend to upcycle, like, random things that I find on the street, like refrigerators, mattresses, furniture, broken furniture, whatever I could put my hands on, even toilets and stuff on the street. Um, but when you're talking about like the leftovers and the, uh, the, you know, like I've always felt like an outsider in the community and also out of the community. Yep. I wasn't always this confident artist that I am today. One of the things that led to this, that I'm able to even sit here with you all, is when I started sharing my vulnerability on these other people's trash, and seeing how the world engages with it and seeing that people are finding empowerment from my suffering, I really found so much strength in like making myself more vulnerable and like being true, being real. And that's why I'm not trying to say I'm nervous. <laughs> um, but, but just like knowing that even though I make work about my personal struggles, like, I think this is a global feeling, a feeling like garbage or feeling like no one wants you or, or and, and, and to know that while a lot of people feel this way, you can still make something out of it and make a life for yourself, so. Thank you so much. We're I, glad to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is such a rich conversation. I want to I want to dig into what um, some of you said explicitly. You just muttered the word under your breath, Pearl. Inauthenticity, authenticity. These two kind of um, identities seem to work in tension with each other very productively for you as artists. And I wonder if you could just reflect on that, um, Lizer. Why don't we start with you? On the authenticity, inauthenticity. Mm -hmm. um, because you were saying before, just to remind you. Um, that there's a lot that's portrayed about the Hasidic ultra-Orthodox community that's inauthentic, and you are able to kind of access that and make it more authentic. But you're also talking about the fact that now it's been 10, 15 years since you left the community. How authentic are you, right? And this is, I think, a very productive tension for you to think about as an actor. Yeah. And, you know, that's just one example. But as, you know, maybe I invite you, the four of you, to think about... Um, to think about how authenticity and inauthenticity serves your art, but also um, draws you near to um, maybe that, like you know, that that spark of inspiration. Yeah, and and I'll pick up where she left off a little bit because I think that uh, I don't want to speak for all artists, um, but I think uh, for myself at least, w one of the reasons I probably became, you know, a, a storyteller in the general term is because I've always found that to be the most persuasive thing for me, right? If you can tell me a good story, if you can draw me in, 
you know, um, like if, if you can make me listen to you <laughs> instead of forcing me to listen to you, uh, you're more likely to succeed. Um, so when I, when I think of the, uh, of, uh, of, of the, um, of the, of the, of the, Authentic, of the authenticity or the art or the storytelling that I do, um, I think if I, can, if, I, if, I, if I can create a character, if I can play the character in a way that people think is real, then I've succeeded. Um, but then on my own part, you know, I'm not trying to fool the audience. For me, it, it, the character has to feel real to me. And that, again, like I said earlier, that has, not, has less to do with the with the with the with the story and the costumes and the hair and all that stuff and and more to do with the with with the inner person i'm not really answering the question i'm rambling <laughs> but i'm trying to get somewhere i'm not sure where um i, I can tell i can tell nobody's left <laughs> you know so i i'm not sure how to answer that. I, I, i'm not sure how to answer that question i'm not sure how to answer that question Yeah, give I, it a I, shot. I, I think it's really it's 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 a, a pretty uh, vague and interesting question. I'm an academic. Yeah, yeah. I can tell. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, it's interesting because uh, film, TV, like theater, is fake. It's fake. So you're starting off with it being like me as an actor and like loser said you try to bring you try to make it as real for yourself as you can and you have to and have to find the the humanity in that and the part of you that that is that um but we all have to collectively suspend our disbelief we all have to be like okay we're now we're pretending this is actually representative of life but there's nothing that's really representative of life if you're being watched right so the whole thing is like it's a it's a it's a it's a play with the authenticity and inauthenticity. And the problem now is, is that I'm getting heady because you're asking this question. So I'm gonna try to bring it back. So I think yeah, now I'm like, I want I want to hear your thoughts on that. Um so for me, I think especially as things have shifted in the um portrayal of Hasidim on screen, there's still this like it's almost like we're stuck in the 80s or 90s. So that's with everything. It's with costumes, it's with just, just stories, right? And I, I, that's something that's like, you want it to be authentic, but there's already that inauthentic quality. And anything, to modernize it is something that I think both you and I are fighting for. Authenticity changes, that's the thing. Authenticity, Authenticity changes. That's, yeah, that's, that's you know, very know what was, what was an authentic Hasidic character it changes. Know, in the 90s? You know, is not an authentic Hasidic character of today. If you watched even like the first documentary about Hasidic Jews, not the first, maybe not the first one, but like in America, um, uh, what's his name? What was he just died? What was the name of the filmmaker? You guys, Hasidim in America. Yeah. Menachem Daum. Menachem Daum. If you watch Menachem Daum's film, all right, and I know some people like the this Belzer Hasid named Gold who's in the film. You watch it, he's like that is no longer what a Hasidic Jew looks like today. Right. right. So it's they, just it's different. So authenticity changes. So I, I, I think for myself as well, like if I am asked to play a Hasidic Jew now, like I play Hasidic Jews differently now, most guys than I played it 10 years ago at the start of my career, um, unless you're doing something that's set in like an earlier time uh, or unless you write a character that's very, very specific about how religious he is, how, you know, like like very emotionally specific, like. This is not a general Hasidic Jew. This is this specific oppressed Hasidic Jew. Yeah, but the thing right? with being, is there a general Hasidic Jew? I no, think, there isn't. Right. But, but characters can be specific and then Cha you play yes. it specifically. But if you do like a general guy, like I'll, I'll give you an example. I recently, I didn't get the role, but I recently got asked to audition for a, for a big movie. And th there was something in the description that was supposed to be a Hasidic Jew. He's supposed to speak Yiddish, Hebrew, and whatnot. That's like a whole, it, it's a chulant of a character. But... And I remember reading it, and I remember reading it, and going like, I, I don't know what to do with this. Like this, this, this person doesn't exist, right? You can't, like, you can't have it, you know, unless you want to make it up, and then we can play with it and create something realistic. Um, and I didn't end up getting the role, but I, but a week later, you know, I get a text from someone I've worked with on a previous project, who said, "Listen, I just got hired to work on this film, and I'm supposed to do costumes and props for this guy." Could you help me out with some Hasidic stuff for this character? And he describes the character, and I'm like, dude, I cannot help you. 
So that is, that is one of the things when you talk about authentic and inauthentic. The authenticity comes from someone who knows what they're creating. You know, I think most people who write stories and write books, they're writing concept or, or, or like a composite characters of real people. A lot of the stories being written about Hasidic Jews are not written by people who have characters in mind. They don't know, like, they, they watched one of us and they're like, ah, yeah, okay, I can make this movie either about Jews, I can make it about Mormons, I can make it about, you know, uh, uh, fundamentalist Muslims, I can make it about anything I want. And he chooses Hasidic Jews because he wants to set it in New York. That's inauthentic. Yeah, there was some, so that's the thing. There are some scripts you can read and be like, okay, you know what, they ask you to, like, if I'm involved in any way, and I'm thinking, can you take the Hasidic part out of it? And does this still work as a story? And why do you have them? Why do you have it be Hasidish? Like, it clearly is, it's, it's not. You're just putting it in for a shock pack of value or to, because people are interested in this. But I think that's the thing. It's that you were saying about if people are writing it that don't have that experience and they're forgetting about the humanity that we all share, if you're Hasidish or not Hasidish, that is the inauthenticity that is, I find that you can't really work with. Anything that is like there's a human being that you understand that is flawed and wants love and wants to belong and is struggling with like, once you understand the human being, then I'm like, okay, now I can make him Hasidish because this is the community he wants to belong to. These are the rules. These are the rules of the world. But oftentimes we get scripts that are, they're, they're, they're just play it. I remember once watching something that you and I both um, consulted on, and they invited us to watch this, and thankfully it didn't go anywhere. It was a, it was a pilot, you remember this? Oh, it was yeah, a pilot that they were trying to sell. Yeah, I and remember that. I wish I was never born. Yeah, yeah, I saw my name, and I was like, take. Like, I, I, I was so embarrassed, and I was squeezing your hand so hard. It was like, I cannot, I'm gonna scream. And I remember turning to the actor, and I was like, next time you play a, ch a chassid, I can't curse, but play an effing human. And it's not fair, it was not fair because I was not, you know, self-regulating, but um, because it wasn't the actor's fault. Yeah. But it, it, it was just, where is the humanity? It was a caricature. And that's what's insulting, I think. Just as a human being, it's insulting. As an artist, it's insulting, you know? But also as a Hasidish person, like coming from, these are people I love, and a huge part of my identity, it, it's like, what are you showing me? You're showing me a cartoon, a caricature of a human being. So I think that's the thing, the most, the biggest thing I think of when you say authenticity versus inauthenticity is can I, under, do, are, do I see the humanity in this character? And that's, I don't know, that's what I'm, I, like, I'm working on this project right now and it, 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 it's so stressful because I'm working with people that don't understand the community but are much higher up in the, you know, they're Hollywood folks and you gotta, so it's a very fine line that I'm walking and a lot of references they have is like, oh, but I saw it in a book. Oh, but I saw it here. But context matters there very much. And the time, like you're saying, things change from the 80s and 90s. And like, so it, it's a, yeah. Sorry, I can talk about this forever. I'm in a ramble. I'm gonna stop now. Oh yeah, this is, this is like, this is, you've just, yeah. you've just dangled a string in front of the cat. Let me, yeah. um, you know, the I'm, cat wanna, from Springfield, Ohio. I want to bring it back to, to Pearl and yeah. to the film that we just saw with my next question, which I- We so didn't, good. Pearl and I didn't answer this question. Do you want, can I move on sure. to the next question, Pearl? Do you mind? I had a good answer. Oh, you did. Okay, I think okay. you oh, should well, answer it. You put you, you put four Hasidim on stage, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden wait a second, they start arguing. Um, see, I, I know how to speak up for myself. Um, yeah, because <laughs> you know, we share a background. Um, I think authenticity is really about an individual's experience. So I think that the broader ultra-Orthodox or Orthodox community has so many versions of it. Again, the nuances, right? Now, when it comes to being authentic, it's up to the, the individual, it's up to the artist on what their experience is. The same like writing a memoir, right? It could be someone would read the memoir and be like, hey, that's not true about our community, that's not true about our family, but, after, but if that's the artist's experience, then that is authentic. So if any of us here are working on a project about our experience, then it's gonna be authentic. Like when I make art about my past, or if I make art about my present, if I make art about any issue that I care about, anything that I, active, that I advocate for, I'm bringing my authentic experience to the table. And I think that if you are genuine with your feelings and you're honest and vulnerable, it will be 
perceived just as that. Thank you. Very good. Answer. Pearl, do you want to say anything? See? Well, it was worth okay. it. I, I wanted, Experience we've been. Don't make Pearl know how to put my answer to that question. <laughs> Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. I, want, I have one question. I, I, the second question I really wanted to get all of your responses to, and because I think it relates so importantly to the film, and then we'll open it up to the to the audience. Um, yes. So you know, we we've been talking about. Our we've been, we've been first, and they go last. <laughs> okay. We haven't been on stage together in a very long time, and I'm really sorry. Audience. The audience would love to hear from you if you speak in the a, microphone. We have a few more minutes of ours, and then um, we're going to turn to the o- to the audience. So, you know, we've been talking up until now about artistic expression and the freedom uh, and autonomy over expression, um, and I wanted to think also about censorship because censorship, of course, mm. within the communities from which you come, is is hardcore, and I this film does such a like complex, nuanced job of of thinking about. Um, who can produce art, um, where one can produce it, where one can't, the punishment for producing art, this, you know, the censoring of one's voice, pulling back, releasing that. So I wanted to, to ask if you all could just think about that aloud with us. Pearl, let's start with you. Yeah, it's actually, um, as promised, I know how to tie it back to the previous question, so I'm about to do it. <laughs> it's one of the things I tell my students all the time. If you're asked a question, but there was something you really needed to say, and it's the last question, you will find a way to answer that question with what you wanted to say. <laughs> but actually, in this case, it's not such a trick. Um, thank you for saying that about the film. That means a lot coming from you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, you make work, you put it out there, you mention this, and then you don't know how it's internalized and what it brings up for people and what they want to discuss afterwards. So I think we're saying that. If you don't mind, I just want to take a second and contextualize some of this. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Sarah, but we um, make the art that we're talking about tonight. You should also know that both of these actors also write their own stuff. But what you just heard is them given material to then have to interpret and quote unquote be quote unquote authentic in a piece of work that they don't even love which is gonna tie to my answer about authenticity. For me, my authenticity meter is being in touch with my why. Why am I doing it? Is it a work for hire, which is what you just heard about, where I am asked to write something. My why, if it's a dollar amount, is my why, and therefore, I have to please the client. So when they're acting in positions where They can't bring exactly what you all were talking about, your true selves, and you watch it and you want to cringe. You know, it's not their work. Their why was to pay the bill or whatever it was, and we all have to do that as artists sometimes. And then there's us creating our work. And I I really think for me, and, you know, Luz and I just finished working on the script we just shot in August, you know, there was a lot of back and forth as to, you know, we were, I've never co-written before, and it was an incredible experience because my why was different than his, and I should say it's the same with me right now and Omi Seidman. I'm trying to adapt her book into a documentary project on Sarah Schneer. I can tell you, and if you've heard Heretic in the house, then you know this already, we do not always see eye to eye. Our whys are sometimes different. The beauty of this particular collaboration and the one we just did is you kind of sign on to have that continued conversation and it's almost like a work marriage or an art marriage or a project of that sort. If you're sitting on your own and making that work on your own, it's a, it's a slightly easier, for lack of a better term, staying authentic or true to your reasons, which is what you were touching on. Like what is, what is the humanity, your humanity in the piece? The inauthenticity in storytelling, if this needs to be spelled out, I will, and I'm sorry if I'm simplifying it for people who do this all the time. You have Michael Wex in the audience, who's a star storyteller, and others. Um, And it's that we are all very complicated walking individuals, but when you're crafting a narrative, especially for film, it's one of the poorest mediums you can touch because you can literally only have that character, and you heard Melissa use the word want, you can only have the character want one thing and it needs to be something that they don't get. And in fact, they learn what they need, and that has to be a flip. 
for the opposite of what they're going for. And it is so painfully simplistic, but it's literally the only way that that 3F structure is gonna work. Even if you wanna break those rules, you have to learn how to follow them. And that is the inauthentic, and kind of you were touching on it, like this is Hollywood, and they're trying to oversimplify. So when we come from a world, and this could be true in any culture, that is so complex and potentially nuanced and potentially you have strings attached to it like we do. We've left it, but we're back, especially the people involved in today and tomorrow's events. We're here, we're in, we're out, we're in, we're out. So when we watch a piece, we're like, wait, 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 that is so not, you know. And number one, it's because it's a very, in a very inauthentic way to represent a human. But number two, it's all the stuff you just heard, which is sometimes the writers, simply their why is to make money, to be dramatic, to create tension, and so they inaccurately portray because they kind of don't give a shit about the community itself, like we do. And they really just want to tell a story that's dramatic, so you work with the Amish, or you work with the extreme Muslim, or you work with the Hasidic Jew, and they look different, and it's just an easy target for an extreme. And that's why you were saying they're not all child molesters, as it were. So when you watch, sorry to say this, Unorthodox, I'm just going to give you my personal opinion. We already know what Nomi feels. She wrote her article about it. It's just shocking how every possible thing that could go wrong is lumped into the Hasidic side. And then you come out and, ta-da, life is easy. Well, it ain't, OK? And it's not all just terrible in that world either. That's literally why we keep getting drawn back you're, in. Because you're answering something I wanted to there's say. There's something to you're it. saying right? something I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. And so She's we saving all, you time. We all come from different perspectives, but the why, you all have just as much a story to tell as the rest of us. You know? And so that kind of goes back to the censorship question. Their why inside the community for doing the films that are being produced now in the Hasidic world, I'm not so sure I would look at it with an eye towards censorship. Their why is to give a platform to the creatives and to keep them feeling like they have a place in the Hasidic world. And the story that they're telling is very, very real for them. And so when you look at like a Malki, is it Weinberger? I forget her last name. Weingarten, rock star in the Hasidic world. That is so authentic to her. And by no means is she, is she concerned about quote unquote censorship. Sure, just like I want a producer to be happy with what I'm doing because I want to either stay in this job or whatever. She's in the community. These are the worlds she's subscribing to. I'm not trying to put on rose colored glasses around censorship. You saw my film. You know I don't live in the Hasidic world. So you understand what I stand for. But I also think it's important to know that those who choose to stay in that world are not necessarily, some are, but are not necessarily feeling the weight of that censorship. Some of them are trying to find ways that's technically in some ways like can be seen as Talmudic. They're trying to find those loopholes where they can work with girls singing and still set, sell it in the local store on 13th Avenue in Borough Park, you know. So yes, of course censorship exists. There's a patriarchy, we're, we're not blind to that. And there is dogma, and there is ways in which, and some have signed up for it. And so they're not feeling burdened by the censorship. Maybe they embrace it. I mean, I can't imagine that life. I, I can imagine it, but I don't live it. But that's my perspective on that. So that is exactly why I wrote someone in their 80s, because someone in their 80s can still feel sexual, can still want to talk about certain things, can still feel erotic, can still do all of these things, and be Hasidish. They're walking humans, like you were saying and want to stay in that world, but wants to dip in on their time to remove the shaito and to perform and not feeling, you know, when they go back that they've lost something that's super important to them. They're doing both. The sneaking part is the tough part, right? That's where the censorship comes in. So I, it's a fine line. I'm done. Oh, no, I think I differentiate between censorship and limitations. You know, I think that the uh, you know, there, if, if you're telling stories in the Hasidic community, I mean, if you read like the Orthodox magazines or the Orthodox books and whatever, there are limitations there, right? I, I wouldn't necessarily call it censorship, that, at least that part. The Goyish stuff that comes into our schools that teach us reading and writing, the, those are censored, right? They censor out the Christmas stuff, they censor out, you know, women and, and all that. Um, so I think, I think that every 
Right, the no blackening matter, of a woman's face. Uh, right, that, black that it is out, full-on black, black magic marker. Yeah, Disgusting. Yeah, yeah. So that's censorship. That is like we don't want you to. You, we don't want you to know about that. But I think when you make art for a specific audience, I think what you have is limitations. Right. Um, you. No one is going to come to your show if it's you know men and women on stage together. Um, and I think that we have limitations in the secular world as well. Right. There's just certain things you can't do. You can't put on film. Um, there are certain things you can put on film in France, uh, you can't put on film in America. Uh, you know, we both, uh, we had a class with Chantal Ackerman, you know, like, you couldn't do, you couldn't teach film the way she taught film, <laughs> you know, anymore. Um, so I think that the, we have it in the secular world as well, and, and I, I think that the uh, um, censorship depends on the consequences, right? Uh, so I think that the, you have, Cent you have censorship in Russia, you have censorship in China, you have censorship in North Korea, you have censorship in other places. That's censorship uh, because there are significant, uh, um, uh, there, there are significant uh, um, consequences to, to going against that. Um, and I think that what, what, what we have in trying to, when, when when, what we have in making films with Hasidic Jews or for Hasidic Jews, and when we make films for the outside world, we have different limitations. Uh, you know, there are certain things that you can't, do in, in film and, and makes as artists, we always want to do that, right? We can't, you know, we can't tell a story about a racist who doesn't use the N-word, right? We just can't, right? So if you want to tell a story, you got to have that in there, even if it makes people uncomfortable, even if people say like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. And I think that's on a lot of issues that we have now, especially in the arts, in the arts community where people are very much like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. No, I think where we come from, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but where I come from, you can say whatever the fuck you want. Okay, and you can put whatever whatever you want in film, and you can tell stories about whatever you want. Um, but it comes with limitations, right? Some people are not going to see it. Some people are not going to want to see it. Some people are not going to be happy about it. But as long as you can make it and put it out there, and no one is going to stop you, I don't think it's censorship. I think you also need to know your audience, right? Dalek yeah. name me made. Sorry to make that profane. Sarah, I really sacred. want to hear from you because you're you're working in a different medium. And yeah. yeah, can you um, talk about it's, that? It's a little interesting to be here on stage with actors and filmmakers, um, and I'm the only visual artist. Um, I first of all want to say that in case anyone hasn't seen, my art is set up outside um, in the main space there, and all my art is for sale. So except for Pripachik, which has been so please support spoken for. Um, Take credit cards. Yes. Well. Through Zell, yeah, it it's works. For the guy in the back with the yes, black Amex. Exactly, so. yes, it does work. Uh, um, the thing about being a visual artist, particularly, I'm self-taught. So I did not go through the system. And most of the opportunities I get to exhibit my art are sort of a little bit away from the system because the art world, just like many worlds, are very like snobby and like, you know, they go by rules, you know. And I think maybe you guys can relate as independent, you know, if you make independent projects, right? Um, so I think I have an advantage here um, when I'm making art or I'm making public art where I can literally say whatever the beep I want. Um, <laughs> and um, I have definitely noticed censorship through that. Like, so for example, of course, I can do whatever I want. Whether will it will it be received well? That's another question. But like, I have had experiences making art in the public space where someone encountered my work while I was still there, and they were like, "Hey, don't use such words around kids," or "Hey, that's too much nudity," or you know, or someone even coming to a show of mine and being like, "Hey, that's like a really like sensitive subject," or you know, like, "Why would you bring that?" painting today, you know, what does it have to do with today? Um, and, you know, so I think that that is censorship, you know, uh, but I, when I'm thinking of censorship, I'm really thinking a lot about my past, my childhood. Like, I grew up in a very, very radical, fundamentalist community and, like, very, very culty. Someone earlier said, hey, no one got to say that it's a cult. And I'm, like, here to say it's a cult. Um, and like literally the school I went to, they cut out entire sections of like our 
history, geography books, science, uh, biology, like for example, topics that talk about the human reproductive system, topics that talk about like Israel or Palestine, uh, topics that talk about things that would make us ask questions, you know? And like their way of censoring us, and they would like sharpie out s sections or like women who were not dressed modestly. They used to draw on sleeves. You guys, did you guys have that? Yeah. They draw on like sharpie, oil sharpie sleeves on naked, naked, like women that wore short sleeves in our textbooks. Oh, elbow cleavage. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so because I was able to break away from that, and mind you, like when you grow up in such an insular bubble cult, it takes years to really free up from that. And you're so right, like when people like are unorthodox, um, when the transition seems to way too smooth. And I had a conversation with someone outside today about my art, um, that like one of the things that I've grown to become strong about, and I wasn't always this confident, is again, talking on, touching on authenticity, is trying to share more of the, what it, the vulnerability of what it was like to leave. Like, the longer I'm out and the longer I've been living this life, and I've, I've left like 25 years ago, so I've worked through a lot of the stuff, but things I would be scared to talk about at least the first 10 years, or sharing bad experiences and of the journey of leaving, forget about the journey that when you're in it, that I've given many interviews about and I've been comfortable, but I've always been shy and nervous to share about, you know, the bad things. Like for example, that time I got, you know, sexually molested by someone who was like housing me, you know? And, or the time that, the time that, you know, uh, um, someone, um, you know, took advantage of me in a different way. Or the time when I put on the first pair of pants, which I made a painting for, special for today, it's outside. I um, love that painting, by the thank way. Thank you, Want that thank painting. you. It's called, Is That What My Butt Looks Like? <laughs> um, after not being allowed to wear pants. Um, I think that the, the, I was censoring myself because I was afraid of other people's reactions. And it took many, many years, and I think I finally come, it took so long, because I like I did a show on my journey in 2016, for example. I've done a couple, but the last one just on this topic was 2016, and I was really censoring myself on like what I'm willing to share with the public because it's scary, you know. Or if you want to talk about abuse from the past or your childhood, and one of the things I learned as a person, also as an activist, so like when you start touching on topics that some people disagree with. And the same, like it's all interconnected to me. Like you can be an ex-Orthodox Jew and make expose art or movies or, you know, where you, d you bring, you just, you know, you expose the dirty things, you know? People are like, hey, hey, you can't do that. That's not fair, you know? And I think that learning to overcome that and learning to also advocate for other things that I care about has allowed me to slowly, look, like I, the two new paintings that I made in the last two months, special for this occasion, is the most raw and vulnerable I've allowed myself to be. And I don't think I would have been able to get to that if I didn't learn to question, like how to uh, um, not, like you literally have to learn to not care about other people's opinion of, who you are, what you represent, what you make, what your activism is about. And just put it out there. People are going to disagree with you, but at the end of the day, it really, like, it all, that's why it's like, so there's so much going on in the world right now, right? And like, every day I wake up and I'm like, okay, just keep, stay yourself. Like, don't worry how someone might treat you. Just, you know, stay authentic. authentic. And this is, why I think I can see myself in the future getting even more real and talking about this the first time I had explored sexually with a when I was like 12 or 13 with my friend and we had no idea it was sexual right like I've been wanting to make a painting about this for years but I was scared to to, to do this because I'm like oh what are people going to think about me what does it mean are people going to label me something you know and 
So growing up so censored, finally discovering what it means to be free in all aspects, on all topics. How, like, we cannot censor ourselves. We just have to be real. Thank you so much. Great. I just want Yes. Uh, we're gonna, we, we're, we have 15 minutes left, and we have to stop exactly at 7 because there's a sound thing happening. So I want to be sure to give some room for our audience members to ask questions. And before that, I just want to say I apologize for that joke. I didn't, sometimes I push the envelope, sometimes the envelope tears. So I know you. They don't. So I heard okay, some groans he's in a there. Jerk. <laughs> Occasionally. We need some help, and I know you're only the actors. However, there is no New York, there is no New, uh, New York City rep anymore, or New York Yiddish rep, and we need really, really somebody to step up. David is sick, and we, you know, you worked in. We really need that. That is so important. Is there anybody that knows anybody that can fill that gap? I I have a very short answer to that. Is there anybody who knows anybody who is willing to pay for it? Yeah. Well, how did he do it then? He got people to pay for it. And who pays what you think? I, I don't know. Does anyone know? Because people who are saying they're getting grants should all tell you what it is. Especially well, those people who are getting grants should forward those grants to me. <laughs> There's some questions in the back. Uh, honestly, like, I got the. the to give a little, to, to broaden a little bit. I mean, I would, we would love to do more Yiddish theater. Like we can't, I can't, like even when David calls me and asks me to be, in, to be in something, especially when I was living in LA, I was like, well, you gotta bring me in. You gotta, I gotta need a place to live and I need food. You know, like these things cost money. Like none of these things are free. You can't put up shows for free. And I know, I know, but even when he was doing it, he couldn't always raise the money. So like the real answer here is not that we need someone like, well, of course we would love David. We want David to do it. But there's many people who want to do this, but nobody wants to sponsor it. Nobody wants to take the risk. Nobody's saying like, well, here's a hundred grand, m do a play, pay your actors, get a theater, do it. No one is doing that. Everybody is like, someone should do it. Yeah. Also, in, uh, just a, a quick thing, in January, there, look out for the, there is gonna be a show with the Yiddish rep. So uh, the same show that we did uh, last year, it's, it's gonna be on, so Good David's Brian. still, uh, no, um, the Gospel According to Chaim? Yeah. Seen it? Yeah, and we're gonna do it again. Yeah. So look out for that, and, and uh, hopefully, I mean, if anybody, yeah, knows anybody, send them our way. Yeah, but it's and like this. Back it's, to your it, opening it, remark, right? Yes. We need more support for the arts. We need more support for the arts. It's the like Yiddish arts. Yeah, on 35th Street. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's like this event here. Like, everybody's like, we should have, we should have, we should have something like this. Okay, we have someone in the audience with a question. What? Next question. Yeah, yeah next uh, question. Sorry about thank that. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so I've been learning a little bit about Williamsburg and um, kind of the history of how that community came about and how they've dealt with gentrification, gentrification from artists nearby. And there's this in interesting concept that I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on. It's this idea that I've only read about within the community, but that the artists who you know were moving into or who have moved into Williamsburg weren't really seen as artists. Like there was just a not even a censorship, but just a kind of that's not what we consider art. Um, so yeah, just curious, uh, you know, how you maybe dealt with that or. I actually have are. a funny story about this. Um, so I went to high school in South Williamsburg, but like right at the tip, and my school, like Division Avenue, and Kent, I think it was, um, behind my school building was a warehouse that the owner of my school owned as well. And at some point, I, I started noticing basically artists, you know, like non-Jewish, like men with long hair and like tattoos and I remember being curious about them, of course, you know, my curious heart. Um, but I remember asking about them, like who are these people and why are they moving into this factory? And 
it was explained to me that they are artistan. Yeah. So I did hear about them being artists, yes. Yeah, and then artistan. there's, there's also Shubinan. just cultural differences and understanding of art. So we talked about how we didn't get, you didn't get access to like museums and stuff, but there's, there's, I mean, it is considered art as well, right? There's different forms of art. So I think some of it is also just non understand, like it's a different culture and there's some clash there, I think, yeah. This might be a good opportunity, you know, to peek back into Nomi's book a little bit on Sarah Schneer because her appreciation of the importance and the place of arts, especially for women in ultra-orthodoxy, if not Hasidim, Hasidism, is really interesting to note from dancing to, you know, um, I don't want to say needle points, but, <laughs> but plays, like she wrote plays, right, poetry, um, so th it's not like there's no place for the arts, it just has its place. There's a question in the middle here. Hi, um, thanks so much everyone. I'm most familiar with Sarah's work, so certainly for you, but everyone else as well. You've all left quite insular Jewish communities and so I wonder if you still feel connected to broader Jewish communities outside of that insular upbringing and what those communities do for your work in art now and how you see your your own Jewish voice and the experiences of ex-Orthodoxy reflected in like broader Jewish issues that affect both Jews and people outside of um, the Jewish community all around the world, so. Um. Hi, Mia, thanks. Um, what I've noticed about my work over the years, so like, you know, like this conference, like, it's like, let's talk about our accomplishments rather than our, you know, sad past um, that everyone is so curious about. Everybody wants to know how many brothers and sisters I have. Um, though, you know, being an artist is hard. Making a living as an artist is even harder. Um, when I first decided to focus on art as my future, I had no ins or no connections with people who buy art or, you know, with any institutions who might show art. Um, and I actually, uh, when I was starting my career, I got a lot of guidance and mentorship through Footsteps, which I'm really grateful for. Um, but I will say that, like, for example, the first press I ever got as an artist was in a Jewish publication. Um, the first, some of the first, of, not my first first, my first real collector is a Haitian woman. But um, some of the other people who started buying my art are including Loser Tversky right here, um, it, um, were, you know, secular Jews, Jews who support footsteps, Jews who have read about me in the Jewish week or, you know, the foreword or, um, and the story, my story helped me sell my art. Now, most artists want their art to speak for themselves, but you gotta start somewhere, you know? So I will say that the fascination of my story got people to wanna support me. And of course, they wouldn't just support me if my art wasn't good just because I had a good story. I'm sure my art, we have another also amazing supporter here, Daniel, in the audience. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and related to, to uh, the other thing, like, I think that I've just seen in myself, like, I think that sometimes the Jewish community tends to, like, forget about some of its problems as a whole. And it's, oh, shit, I'm a little bit, like, <laughs> Not sure um, what to say, but but uh, but I think that like I think that the, my personal ex orthodox experience I don't know if you guys feel that um, certainly allows me to reflect on other on other problems and I try to be the voice of reason when it comes to such things and because I'm already like a questioner so I'm like hey let me tell you a little bit more about questioning other problems we have. I'll try, I'll try to be brief um, um, because we only have a few minutes. But I found that uh, when, when I left, I was I completely discounted the whole Jewish thing. So I wasn't really interested in trying to find another Jewish community. I was like, yeah, I'm done with being Jewish. Um, and But the second thing is I also think that 
what I found is that the majority of like the secular or even the modern Orthodox Jewish community does not like us very much. <laughs> you know, we, we we're not being welcomed really uh, in that world. Um, they were like, we don't want the Hasidic, you know, leftovers really. Um, so that that was my experience early on. Um, but later, I did start going out a little bit, and I remember in LA, I was taken to this uh, on some chestoira. I was taken to this reform synagogue, and I remember walking in, and there were women in pants dancing with live music, drinking tequila, and I was like, "What kind of chestoira is this? I'm like, what do you, what do you guys, what do you think you're doing here? I, do you think you're Jewish? Is that what you think you're doing?" It's like, "Well, what is this?" So it's all very, very confusing to me, and I never quite um, understood. Um, that, that, I mean, I understand it obviously intellectually, but it never really connected to it uh, for me personally. I think my, my connection to the larger Jewish community is, is more an issue of like safety, you know, like of, of, of achdes, of Jewish unity, of like the thing that brings us all together, if, you, if it really comes down to it, is they want to kill all kinds of Jews equally. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing that brings us together in the end. So to me, that's, that's something that I feel like I in terms of Jewish unity that exists. I think just a quick thing, I think for me, I think has, being Hasidish, I, I first, when I first kind of left, I, have, I struggle with wording, but when I first, of, of this experience, I was just like, I don't even know what it is to be Jewish. And recently I've come back to being like, I am Hasidish, I'm not religious. But culturally, it's different. So there is like shared values in some ways, and there's shared experience, but also culturally, like I'm not an American Jew in the way that somebody that grew up as just an American Jew that's not as observant or not in this insular world, I I'm different. And, and starting to like appreciate that, and, and it, it, culturally, the way I speak, all, all of it as to how I see the world is different. And at the beginning, just to your point, uh, the broader Jewish community wanted to fix me, I felt. It's like, if you're our problem, we'll help you. What if I'm not a problem? What if I don't want to be like you? What if, you know, you were saying about problems, but just like, what if I don't want to belong and you're telling me the right way, right? When I first left, somebody was like, oh, you could do everything, just don't eat pork. It's like, why are you giving me rules, like your rules, you know? And so I think that that's, it just, the Jewish community, what I love now is as an actor, I get to work with Yiddishists, which there's a whole history with that, but there's there's a lot of Jews that come and see theater that are like excited about that. And I think that's more my connection to like the broader Jewish community. It's people that are interested in Yiddish or just Jewish works. And um, yeah, that's how, like building community of artists, of Jews, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think my experience with um, other Jewish communities when I quote unquote left, which again is a very complex way of putting it, but I did leave, right, in order to pursue an education, is through education. So some of my earliest supporters for my films were places like the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture, YIVO. Um, I think a lot of doors were open for conversation and dialogue. Um, and it also allowed me an opportunity to find my way of communicating my Judaism out of my Jewish community. I never left Jew Judaism, Jewishness. People say, oh, you left the, the fold. I'm like, I never left the fold. I'm just not Hasidish. So, and I am culturally, of course. So I don't, you know, and I continue that way. Like I taught Yiddish at Rutgers. I worked for the Workman's Circle, Workperson Circle, I don't know, they've renamed. Um, Point being, worker circle, point being that I have found different aspects of Jewish history um, as a thread into my Jewishness, whether it's the ethics, the activism, um, like I said, the education. I myself am in education now. The storytelling is deeply Jewish for me. Um, you know, you look at the mach, you know, the not the mach, the on um, Pesach, you know, you say you Seder, and like we're literally people of story. And so, you know, there's many ways in which I find my way in and through and because of my Judaism and um, specifically as a Jewish woman too. So I have a lot of positive. And also, I do wanna say this one thing in 10 seconds. It's Jewish film festivals that have allowed me to create a platform for conversation. So I really just wanna do a shout out to supporting those and going to those and continuing those conversations. Thank you so much to this incredible panel of artists, Thank Pearl, you. Melissa.
Uh, deserve, Sarah. Thank you all for sticking around.